Thank you everyone for coming. Good afternoon and, and welcome to our June Leadership Seminar. Huge thank you goes out to NOAA because they graciously sponsored today's platform, uh, thereby doubling the number of registrants who could attend. So before introducing today's distinguished speaker, I wanted to provide a little bit of background about the seminar series. So switching to my slides here. So this is the Federal Leadership and Professional Development Seminar Series, and we started this in September. The series is sponsored by MAGIC, the ARC, um, Making Art Great Implementation Committee. And then also uh, for this seminar, it's also being sponsored by NOAA as well. As I mentioned, they are providing the platform for the series. And just a quick disclaimer that no statement in the seminar should be construed as any official position of any uh, federal agency. So the seminar goals, uh, the goal of the seminar platform is to provide an avenue to share federal leader expertise and lessons learned, also to provide free training at a time when resources are limited for several agencies, and also bring individuals together and foster intra and interagency connections, collaborations, and sharing. So, so far the, the seminar has really uh, gathered a federal-wide reach. We have people attending all across the continental U.S. and Hawaii, and uh, possibly abroad as well. So we had uh, almost 1,800 folks try to register for the seminar, so it really is growing. And I anticipate as the series continues, we're going to be getting about two to 3,000 per seminar. So here are some quotes about uh, the, the feel of the seminar and the advantage of having uh, federal experts sharing their expertise with others. And I, I think it's been a great experience and it really has been wonderful to see the, the sharing of expertise across the, the agencies. So if you are in person, you will receive a, a leaf and you'll see there's a huge um, seven foot tall tree with leaves. Each of the leaves have a biggest lesson learned from previous seminars. Uh, if you are attending remotely, you will receive a question in your evaluation afterwards for what your biggest lesson learned was. So again, thank you very much for, uh, for attending today. Our next uh, seminar will be on August 16th at noon. Um, Bill Timish is gonna be talking about action learning and leadership development, and he's coming uh, from Department of Justice. So uh, now back to our actual seminar today. So today's topic is advancing your federal career, how to position yourself for career progression and promotions. So this topic of great interest is being presented today by uh, Robert Huttenlocker. So Mr. Huttenlocker comes to us today from the USDA, where he serves as the Assistant Inspector General for Management. He has a Bachelor of Science in Finance and a Master's of Business Administration from George Mason University. He started his career in the federal government in 1989 as a budget formulation analyst with the U.S. Department of Treasury's Financial Management Service. Since then, he has had a 27-year career at the USDA, during which time he has gained a wealth of management and investigative experience. He most recently served as a deputy administrator for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, or APHIS's uh, Marketing and Regulatory Programs business, business Services, where he directed a staff of 750 administrative management professional, professionals, providing acquisition and asset management, emergency management, financial management, human resources, information technology, and investigative and enforcement services. As the current inspector, Assistant Inspector General for Management at the USDA, Mr. Huttenlocker is responsible for the Office of Management's Administrative Services Division, Financial Management Division, Human Resources Management Division, Information Technology Division, and all of the business services that the Office of Management provides to OIG's nationwide staff. Mr. Huttenlocker and his wife, Denise, reside in Montgomery Village, Maryland. In his spare time, Mr. Huttenlocker is an average bowler, golfer, and photographer. Please join me in welcoming Robert Huttenlocker. Thanks, Kim, and uh, thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone who came here today or that uh, is participating online. I truly appreciate it. I, I would say this, um, there's nothing that I enjoy more as part of my uh, job than um, helping others uh, reach their developmental goals, uh, their career goals. I spend a lot of time doing it. That's how Kim and I actually met um, when she was a uh, Presidential Management Council Rotational Fellow. Uh, she came to one of the mentoring sessions that I did, and uh, so our relationship was born there. So I'm very, very happy to be here. I believe uh, everyone has seen the slides at this point. They, they've some gone. Have some have gone out. Well, the slide. I've put together a lengthy presentation here, which you'll all get. And it is, um, we won't be able to get through all of it today, not certainly in the detail that we would have liked, but it's going to be a real good reference document for you going forward. Um, we'll see how we go and how the pace goes. 
but there's a lot of information in here. I could literally talk for four to eight hours with you if I had it, but we don't. So we're going to do the best we can. Before we start, I'd just like to say three things. Um, for, how many of you in the room here were monitoring the Washington Capitals uh, playoff run, right? So that's a sports thing. Why am I raising that? Actually, uh, if you have followed the Capitals over time, and if you followed even this uh, playoff run, they showed you two things that if you take it away um, are critical to career success, just as they are sports success. Uh, the two, te two things that this team did that previous Caps teams did not do is they played extremely well together and they were incredibly resilient. I will tell you that as a, as a senior executive, I believe those are the two most important attributes, playing well together and resiliency, okay? So if you remember anything from today, remember that. The next thing, um, it's interesting, my wife, uh, uh, Denise, she works for FDA, she's an executive resources um, officer and uh, very supportive of me, always has been, thought this was a great opportunity for me to do this presentation. And then uh, one day this week, uh, one of her um, colleagues came in and said, hey, is your husband Rob Huttenlocker? And she said, yes, he is. And she said, um, oh, well, I signed up for his webinar on Friday. So my wife then said, don't embarrass me. <laughs> so we're going to try not to do that. And the, the, the reason I talked about my passion for um, this type of um, work, you know, helping others and, and working with folks. And the reason for that, and you'll get more into it as we go, but I myself uh, am a product of, of numerous great mentors and coaches. Uh, my career, which has really exceeded expectations, would never have done uh, as it did without the help of folks doing the kinds of things that I'm doing here today, uh, that I do individually with folks, taking a personal interest in me, telling me when I was getting off the track and those kinds of things. So I believe we have a responsibility at whatever level we are is to help other people get to that level or beyond. So that's kind of how we're here. The golden rule of professional development, we talk about this all the time, every, every mentoring session I do, this comes up. And uh, those of you that are participating today, you embrace the idea, but just to say it, your professional development and advancement, our professional development and advancement, is first and foremost your or my responsibility. Many, many people will play into your development and your success, but you are primarily responsible. You have to take the initiative, you have to do the right things. Goal setting, we'll start with that. Throughout time, I've noted that some people have extensive roadmaps to where they want to get early in the going. Some people have no idea where they want to go. Myself, uh, early in my career, I was brought into an organization by a senior executive uh, who, who was my first and, and actually career-long mentor and uh, a, a fabulous individual. And at that time, early in the going, uh, I didn't necessarily have an extensive roadmap, but I said, well, if, if SES is the best you can do, that's what I want to try to do. And I made, you know, as we get, we'll get into this later, but I did make decisions throughout the course of time uh, toward that goal. As I have got more and more years of experience, though, and, and working with projects and organizational issues, one of the things that has, it really stands out to me for anything to be successful, whether it's a project uh, or, or any other real aspect of the job, is do we have clarity of purpose? Do we know up front what we are trying to do? And so these are just some questions that you can consider. You know, do you have short-term goals? Do you have long-term goals? Um, are you committed to being one thing? You know, I'm a biologist and that's what I want to do my entire career or I want to be an astronaut, or, you know, for me, most of my career, I was either in um, administrative management or compliance type jobs, but there has been some variation in that as well. And so you just got to pick, I want to stay in this path, or I'm open to what comes and I'll adapt as it goes. We're going to talk more about job selection as we get into it. Um, are you committed to self-improvement? I believe the folks that are participating today, I believe Kim, I think, I think we are uh, committed to that. Are you willing to sacrifice? Um, sometimes we have to do things, you know, outside of the work hours or extended work hours. Are you willing to do that? Can you 
balance work and family issues. This comes into the decision-making process later. We'll talk about that. Um, in our case, for example, um, my wife and I, we, we ended up in the same place, um, but she waited uh, several years beyond when I started pursuing SES jobs because we had young sons. One of them was pursuing college scholarships with a lot of time involved. She thought it best to wait until after he got to college. That's, those are decisions that you should make. You know, what is the right decision for you at the time? I want to talk a little, I don't want to talk really a whole lot about me, but I need to talk a little bit about me so you understand um, a little bit more about why this is important to me. And I will say this too as a proviso, I don't make anything up. Everything I tell you actually has happened and is true. I promise you that, okay? So my career now is uh, 29 years total. Uh, I have, I break it into really into four sections by seven year periods roughly, okay? The first seven years of my career, I was purely a staffer uh, from the seven level to the 13 level. OK, what I would say is that during that time, I was uh, indisputably a high production staffer. Uh, the boss loved me. Uh, did everyone else in the organization? I would say no, they did not, uh, because I didn't really care what they thought. I thought I knew everything. Uh, I didn't think I needed them to assist me. I just figured I could do it all on my own. And uh, fortunately, over those seven years, and especially in the latter portion of that, I had uh, my career mentor, I had others that were either indirectly or directly trying to tell me that that really isn't the way to long-term success. You're gonna have to change how you operate. So if you were listening there, that was those first seven years, I would say I did not play well with others, okay? It was really more about me and how I could get to the next step. As I was uh, selected for my first supervisory position, GS-14, in 1996, I was 28 at the time. My career mentor, as I was heading out, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it is true that he said it. At the time, he told me, he said, Rob, I just want you to consider this. Everybody that I ever have known that became a GS-14 before the age of 30 never went any further. Now, I don't believe that was actually true, and I know that it's not now, because I've seen many people do that. But 22 years later, I'm here talking to you about that quote, exactly the way he said it to me. And the impact of it was great for me, and it really kind of drove what um, I call my epiphany. And my epiphany was, I'm sitting there in 1996 in my first GS-14 supervisory job, really when your life changes, forever when you get that supervisory part of it in there and you're responsible for other people. And I said, well, my, my long-term goal, as you know, was, well, be an SES or someday. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I've got 30 years to go and a 15 and an SES are the grades to get. That's a long time. I'm going to sit somewhere, right? And whether I sit as a 14 or a 15 or SES, I'm going to be in one job for a long time at one level. So I actually said, you know, maybe now's the time to just slow down. Maybe now's the time to not worry about the next job. Maybe it's time to worry about mastering the current job and taking care of the people around me. And I, that was, it was really a conscious shift in approach that then at that seven year point, then really kind of changed my course for the future and really ultimately led to all the success that I've been unfortunate enough to have. I have now been a supervisor in uh, four different agencies and numerous other positions. Lots of different people that I've worked for, uh, with uh, and, and over, over the years. And you know, some of those jobs, I've, I've often gone in from one agency into a different one, crossed organizational lines. Sometimes when you do that, the agency you go to is very receptive. The folks were looking for a change, they're, they wanna see someone new, whatever. Sometimes they're not. Uh, they they kinda like the status quo. They didn't want anyone to change things. They wanted to continue on the path they were on. So this happened when I, when I became a 15 back in 2002, I'm going to say of the organizations that I have gone to, that one was the least happy to have me initially. I'll just leave it at that. 
and uh, I, I crossed from one agency to another. I was director of compliance. And uh, when you're in that type of work, you know, you have to do things better than everybody else because you're the ones judging everybody else, much like when you're in the inspector general's office. So I, that staff, I would say, was kind of mixed. I think half were welcoming and half were not welcoming. And I will tell you, the first six months, I didn't sleep too well, kind of trying to wonder what was going on. But I had some messages that I developed uh, going into that job, and then I've used in other jobs um, since. And just to try to, in a simple way, kind of convey what I'm looking for, what I believe are keys to organizational individual success. And you know, most of this stuff isn't rocket science. They say everything I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. And to some extent, that's really true. I mean, it's, it's very fundamental stuff. Uh, I, I promise you, and if you can do it, you'll be successful. But some of the things we'll talk about here are what I call commitment to excellence. I didn't quote that. It's been around for a long time. It, it has special meaning to me, and we everyone kind of grasps it. The five T's is something that I did uh, come up with to try to, um, in a very simple way, um, give folks an idea of my expectations. I want to talk about the value of special projects and activities. Um, mentors and coaches, you're going to hear that several times. But I want to talk about that again. And then I want to talk about playing well with others again, a consistent and persistent theme in this presentation, and what I call the 5 p.m. phone call test. And you'll understand that when we get to it. The commitment to excellence is, you know, what are the kinds of things that I look for in staff, and what are the kinds of things that I believe lead to success in any job? And what I would say is in virtually any job, the things here on the screen lead to success. They're not rocket science. Are honesty and integrity, and that's foundational. Are you technically competent? Do you understand the job that you do? And can you do it in a consistent way, dependable way? The next one's really important. This one's where a lot of um, folks get off track. Problem solving. A lot of people are good at problem identifying. We want... We want problem solvers, right? Okay, I don't want someone to come into my office and say, Rob, the building's on fire. What do you want me to do? By that point, we're all cooked. What I want you to do is come in and say, Rob, the building's on fire. And while you were busy um, attending to the IG, we set the alarm off. We started the evacuation. We've um, done a, a accountability of the staff. And uh, we have someone ready to meet the uh, fire department. That's what I want, okay? But this is where it is. People, everyone wants to be promoted, but they don't want to think more in the next job than they did in the last one. Bad, bad. Problem solving is a, is a critical one. Um, work ethic, obviously, are you a hard worker? You know, I'm a believer. What I look for my staff, I say, what I want you to do is I want you to come in, work hard for your shift, whether it's eight, nine hours, whatever it is, and then I want you to go home and I want you to enjoy your life. I don't want you to feel like you have to work 60 or 80 hours. It's not something that I have done as a matter of uh, routine in my career. There's been short stints, special issues that you have to deal with, but normally, no. I mean, I go all out all day, and when I get home, I'm usually, I can fall asleep anywhere between 8 and 10 these days. You know, that's it. As soon as I eat and sit on the couch, it's any, any idea when it goes. Communications and collaboration, critical. Collaboration, play well with others, same issue, okay? We'll talk about it more. Customer service. You know, some jobs are more customer service oriented than others, but virtually every one has some element of customer service. And are you there trying to help the people that need your service? And diversity and inclusion, I'm a huge believer in it. Um, this comes, you know, my first, when I talked about that first GS14 job I went into in 1996, when I went into that job, there were six senior staff members in that organization. All six were white males. I, I don't believe that's the best way for an organization to be. And I can tell you by the time I left, when I left that organization six years later, I was the acting branch chief, and we did not have six white males at the top. We had much better diversity. And in fact, I was replaced by uh, a female, uh, the first in branch history. Um, you, you just got to have, you got to have those different views and ideas and experiences. Otherwise, it's just everyone basically saying the same thing. The five T's. This was the other thing that I first used with that office that was <laughs> not all that receptive. And it's, it's really simple, right? Together. Well, that means when we're in an office, all of us have a role to play. All of us contribute. Are we working together like the CAPS did 
the last uh, couple months, right? Just incredible. Trust. Do we trust each other? Trust is a big thing in the workforce. Everyone, everyone, people have agendas. They're worried about getting promoted like I was my first seven years, all these kinds of things. But trust is really important. You know, can we trust that folks are endeavoring to do the right thing, that they're putting the organization first and those kinds of things? And, and do we trust? And what I find with trust is there's different levels of trust, right? There's an, sort of a basic level of trust that normally you have for someone unless they give you reason not to. And then there's this business of how you gravitate toward the inner circle of trust, different, okay? What you really wanna be is someone that folks feel comfortable having in that inner circle. Uh, teach, whether you're the leader or a junior staffer, you can be a teacher. In that one job that Kim mentioned that I had my previous job where I had 750 employees across all those disciplines. I wasn't the foremost expert in more than maybe one or two out of literally hundreds of activities, okay? What I needed was for folks that, that worked in the organization to teach me what I needed to know and to help me in the decision-making area. Talk, talk gets back, collaboration, playing well with others. Are you talking? Are you transparent? Are you honest with people? Are you engaging? Or are you hiding in the corner withholding information? You want to be those former traits and try. Like I said, come in, work hard for your shift, give it all you have, and then go home. But give an honest day's effort for an honest day's pay. The five T's. Now, what I'll tell you is it was funny in this office, and we got over those, those humps fairly quickly um, and, and moved on. I had a really successful five-year run in that office. I will tell you that a someone printed out commitment to excellence in big in like a big uh, banner and put it under the clock as you came in and out of the office. And uh, also one or more of the staff had the five T's posted in their office. So they resonated with people. And so what I would say is, however you choose to capture it, I mean, borrow these or come up with your own uh, that, that are meaningful to you. But these kinds of things that people can get their hands around um, make a difference. And as you look at your own work now, consider how are you in these areas? Are you doing these kinds of things? And are, and are you as successful as you want to be? Special projects. Okay, everyone has a job. You can be great in your job. Okay, some people have been in the same job in the same place for 30 years. That's great. It, it is. It really is. If they're, if they're happy, if that's their goal. But if you're looking, if, you're, if your goal is, I want to move to the next level, I want to become senior executive, I want to become, you know, whatever, how do you do that? How do you distinguish yourself? Well, it, 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 it behooves you to be more than a one-trick pony, okay? Because folks say, you know, and, and, and can you be more reliant on your leadership and communication type skills than your technical, okay? So, uh, you know, looking at special projects, and we'll talk about some that, that examples of those, but they, they provide you with an opportunity to demonstrate you're more than that one-trick pony, that you're flexible, you're resourceful, that you have leadership, and you can lead at all levels, right? Whether you're GS7, you're SES, you can still lead, okay? Special projects afford you an opportunity to build new relationships and expand networks. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I had some... It was great. I, I, I met people I would never have known that became, you know, close friends for years afterwards, where if I hadn't done the special project outside of my normal, you know, area, I wouldn't even know those folks. And, um, you know, developing a reputation as a go-to person or a fixer is never bad. Um, I can tell you that for my previous uh, agency, I, I, I would say the administrator viewed me as one of his fixers. And I can tell you that I had one or two folks that I viewed as my fixers, folks that I could go to with anything and they'd find a way to do it, okay? Now, in my new job, I've only been there a few months, so we're still figuring all that out. But the bottom line is in every organization, you have some folks that can really deliver under any circumstance, okay? What are they? Well, unique on-the-job projects, um, I had one situation in my previous job where one of the other programs had a facility. I won't go into great detail on this, but the facility was had long been operating under uh, a memorandum of understanding with um, uh, a state entity. It was kind of operating as an unincorporated corporation. 
And the Office of General Counsel had said five years before, that needs to be a federal entity. Uh, my, one of my bosses calls me in after a meeting one day and says, hey, Rob, we have this uh, need. We need someone to federalize this entity. You're at the top of the short list. Can you do it? I, at that time, I didn't know anything about that specific program. I didn't even know that facility existed. Uh, but I said, sure, I'll do the best I can with it. Built a team, start off with a team of five, turned into a team of about 50 over four months. We, um, we, we took that facility, we federalized it, we turned it back to the program as a federal entity. That's a, those kinds of things, when you can do that for your agency, your employer, it's, it's game changing, life altering. Um, it also leads to more requests, uh, just FYI. Um, emergency situations, you know, my previous agency there, they, they were responsible for um, the avian influenza outbreak response. Um, the, um, uh, if there was a foot and mouth disease out outbreak, even when the hurricanes went through and ravaged uh, various areas um, last year in the south and in, in, the, in the islands, uh, we were involved with that. And that's a whole nother thing on top of your job and, and making sure that assistance gets there. That's when people come together, show they're good in crisis situations. Combined federal campaign, I did this back in 910. I led the agency campaign. That's when I started to meet these folks I would never have known otherwise. We had a highly successful campaign that year. It was just something I'll never forget. It was outside of my job, it was a collateral function, but it was an opportunity to, to work with people, lead people, and, and make something really good happen. Feds Feed Families is another one. I haven't actually done that one specifically. It's been, I've had folks that in my organization that have, so I've essentially been responsible, but I hadn't personally done that one, but it's very similar combined federal campaign. Uh, award ceremonies and party planning. Well, that may sound like not important. Oh, but it is. You get up in front of hundreds of people at an agency award ceremony and you're the MC, or you um, pull together the administrator's holiday party and you know that shows that you have some organizational skills, some leadership skills, and that's helpful. And speaking at special events, whatever they are, just like this, you know, because public speaking becomes increasingly important as you move up uh, the chain. We doing okay so far? We good, everyone? You get something out of this? Okay. So let's talk about mentors and coaches again. Um, this is what I say to everyone. I, I don't know what grade level we have in this room, but I would say um, no matter what, uh, you should have one or more, and you should be one or more to one or more people. And uh, the, the thing is, whether you're a mentor, which for our, my understanding of that, the mentor is someone that more speaks from experience to try to prevent you from the pitfalls that I did. For example, when I was um, a rambunctious youngster and running through people to get what I was trying to get, um, someone saying, Rob, that's not the way to do it. What you need is this. But a coach would be one that more or less helps you kind of work through the issues with your own kind of ideas and develop. So I'd go and say, Dave, uh, people don't seem to really be responding to me too well. Um, and he might say, well, why do you think that is? And I said, well, yeah, I don't know. And then he'd say, well, are you sure? And then you kind of work through it. So that's kind of how I split the two. But when I work with someone, I, whatever they need is what I try to give them in, in that role. But it's really important. And, and when you're in the role of helping the other person that comes to you, what you'll find out is you learn as much as they do. Because you'll be working through a problem with them and you'll all of a sudden say, well, that's a great idea. Why didn't I do that when I was in the same situation, right? So it's really beneficial. So I couldn't, emphasize the importance of coaches and mentors more and being one. Now, when you establish those relationships, you can't just say, Nancy, will you be my coach? If there's, you know, she may, Nancy may be great, you may be great, but you got what you want, that relationship you need where there's a real interest in one another. You know, a real interest, the person's going to make themselves available to you when you need them, that they're going to spend, you know, allocate time to you. It's not just something they're doing to fill out their performance appraisal at the end of the year. It's, it's that chemistry is critical. Um, throughout the time, I, I've generally had really good with my folks. I can't say in every case it has been because it's a two-way thing, just like every relationship. But it's critical to the success to have that. I think you, you meet routinely. Typically, when I have a formal arrangement, I'll meet with someone uh, monthly, plus or minus. And then, you know, if there's a special situation, maybe they have a job interview, something like that, they will, um, I'll fit them in. I had an individual, long-term uh, colleague, 
in my office earlier today, getting ready for her first SES uh, interview. And uh, I walked her through some paces on that, gave her some recommendations for that. Um, when you have the time, especially everyone wants a senior executive mentor. Everyone wants the administrator or the commissioner, okay? Well, you can't all have that. We can't all get that. You kind of kind of go up as you go. But regardless, when someone says, okay, we're going to devote an hour to you today, just going in there and shooting the bull, talking about the caps and America's Got Talent and maybe, you know, career issues, that's not what it's about. How about you, you know, come in with an issue that you want to talk about that we can work through. Let's make it a productive use of the time, okay? See the difference? You know, just because you're talking to a senior person doesn't mean you're getting anything out of it. Let's get something out of the time, make it beneficial. Um, talk openly and, and listen actively and, um, and recognize the confidentiality is important in these things. You know, you, someone comes to you, you provide them advice, and then all of a sudden they find out that 18 people know that you had that conversation. That's going to pretty much bring that relationship to a, a, a screeching halt. And use the information you get in these sessions and in these interactions to drive your self-improvement. Playing well with others, the 5 p.m. phone call test. This is, I love this one. And I did, I did come up with this one. And it's actually happened. The 5 p.m. phone call test is a good way to figure out how people are reacting to you. How much, because people may not like you, but they're not gonna, well, they don't generally say I don't like you, but they'll hide from you. Or they'll, they'll be in the hall and they'll all of a sudden be lining into the office or look down or they'll look at their phone. They don't want to engage you, right? But when it really comes, when, when the rubber meets the road, is in your moment of need, is the person you need there for you and vice versa. You got me? So the way the 5 p.m. phone call test works is this. It's Friday at 5 and you're packing up your stuff to go home for the weekend. And the phone rings, and we all know who it is, right? Because we got caller ID. So I know, I know it's uh, Beth on the phone. And uh, ooh, I have a decision to make, don't I? What's my decision? Do I answer the phone, right? And this one guy called me out one time in one of these sessions. Sometimes people do hold on a little tight. Okay, this is an educational experience. He said, well, that's your job. You should answer the phone. Oh, that's great. I get it. But work with me on this example. Okay, the, the reality is we make these decisions, right? And the decision is this. Oh, that's Beth. Mm, we're close. Mm. If she called me at 5 on Friday, I'd want her to answer, and she would. And uh, mm. Or uh, she can wait until Monday. I really don't want to get wound into this because I won't be getting home until seven, et cetera. Has anyone had this happen? Okay, all right. You don't have to tell me what you did, but I know you did both at one time or another. So here's the thing. So I had this happen, it literally happened to me uh, in my previous job. A, a colleague, close colleague, it is late in the day and I am packing up and that phone rings and I said, I have to answer that phone because she would answer it for me, okay? But this all gets to relationships and how important it is, okay? I can tell you, first seven years of my career, probably Dave would have been right, never would have gone further. The whole last 22 years, my value to every organization and the reasons I have been successful is because I can call virtually anybody anytime and they will answer the phone, that they'll be there for me and that network building and those kinds of things. And you get that by doing the right things. I mean, you're nice to people. Are you responsive to people? Do you help them or is it all about you? Those kinds of things. So this five, you're gonna remember this now. It may not be five o'clock, you may leave it three or whatever, but someday soon, someone's gonna call you or email you right as you're trying to leave and you're gonna remember that Hutton Locker said, how am I gonna handle this? And what does that tell you? And what does it tell you when you're looking for someone and no one's answering? That they're telling you something. Okay, I promise you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about looking for a new job, right? Because it's about promotion and progression and all that stuff. Well, looking for a new job, everyone's, you know, people do it at different times. Some people are looking for jobs all the time. But, but there comes a time when for either a developmental reason or because you want to change or whatever, you're, you're going to look for a new job. 
So what, what are some important considerations? Well, I think the first one, when, whenever we're talking about our career, is be selective and make wise decisions of what jobs you're going to pursue and what jobs you're going to take. I have applied for very few jobs over time, highly selective. Um, in terms of that, because, you know, you, you don't have to look far. You can look in the media, right? I won't name them here, but there's certain federal departments that are always kind of in the news and it doesn't sound like it's a real happy place to be. Okay. So just because they, ha they're throwing around GS 15s and you've been trying to get one, doesn't mean that's a great idea to go there. You, you got me because you're going to get there and then you're going to want to scramble back because it's not going the way, and I believe me, I saw this, I've seen this over the course of time, folks do it, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, bail me out. So now it's, you know, the easy thing about um, when you're pursuing a job, it's really easy on the person, the applicant. I always say there's only two things you have to be able to do to apply for a position. You have to be, in your heart of hearts, you have to be able to say, I believe I can do that job, and I believe or I, I believe I can do that job and I want to do that job, okay? Those are different, right? I mean, there's some jobs that we could probably do, but would we really be happy in them, right? And, and vice versa. So do I believe in my heart of hearts, I can do that job and I want to do that job? If you say yes to both those, put that application in on USA Jobs and give it a, give it a whirl and see what happens. Um, what I would say is um, it's never good when you're um, throwing resumes out all over the place and when someone calls you for an interview, you're like, oh, gee, what job was that? That suggests you're really not targeting and it's, a, it's not a good way to respond to them. Um, I think when you're looking for, there's key decision points that we have, forks in the road. Let me just talk about that. Back when I was with that organization, um, the one that had the six white males when I first started, and I was the assistant branch chief, that was a, that was a different type of job for me. That was a program management role with um, a produce inspection organization, okay, as opposed to the more administrative and compliance type jobs I had done. So 15 branch chief permanent is on the street. While FAS, the other, other foreign ag service, puts the um, uh, director of compliance job out. And so I'm thinking, well, what do I want to do here? Because both jobs were, I, I could answer both questions, yes. Ultimately, I did apply for both. But because my long-term goal at that point had become to uh, pursue my mentor's job when he retired as my first one, uh, I made the decision that if both jobs were available, I would go to the director of compliance one, and that's the way it, it turned out. And so that's when I, I went to that job. And I would turn, now, just to, to finish that story, it did turn out that, I, that my first SES position that I applied for was my mentor's job. I actually finished second in that one. And then I got one a month later, um, the, the first one. So things just work out as they do, you know, because you got to be the right person at the right time for these things, okay? Best I could tell in that case, the agency head felt like, you know, 20 years of, of this guy and then to bring his protege behind wasn't what they wanted to do. They did, they did tell um, uh, APHIS to hire me when APHIS asked. Um, so that was nice. Again, playing well with others, you need it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, laterals. Some folks, oh, they don't like the idea of lateraling into a different job. Uh, I've been a 14, so why do I want a, another 14? Well, um, right now, you're not getting a 15. There isn't one available. And this other 14, maybe it brings supervisory experience or maybe it brings um, just a different expertise for you to learn. Say you've been a procurement person, but now you have an opportunity to learn budget. Never hurts to learn budget, ever. If you have an opportunity to do that in any way, it's always good to know something about the budget. Um, or you're an IT person, all of a sudden, hey, wait, there's an HR opening or whatever. Okay, so there can be value in that. And there can even be value, and I've even seen people, you know, go a step back to go forward, okay? Each one of these situations is situational. Um, and then the value of, well, the supervision issue, you know, you have to make a decision. Do you really want to be a supervisor or not? That's a critical decision. That's a fork in the road for everyone. Don't decide you want to be a supervisor just because you make more money. Bad idea, okay? Bad idea. You want, you want 
those types of relationships, those responsibilities, the ability to get more done through a team than uh, just yourself. Uh, but if you don't embrace those things, then, you know, a non-supervisory track is probably the one. And then the value of due diligence, whatever job you're pursuing, look at uh, it very carefully, talk to people, you know, look at FEVS results, all those kinds of things. Is that a place I want to be? Now, when you look at jobs, I think, I think there's three reasons that people pursue jobs. And they're all valid, as, as noted there. The first one is, is, I want to do that job itself. Oh, man, I want to be a budget officer. That's what I want to do. That's great. Okay. The next one would be, I want to work for an organization, right? Okay. NASA is always number one in FEVS, it seems, right? So people might say, oh, man, I want to work for NASA. Or I want to work for NASA because those rockets going off is exciting or whatever. I just want to be part of NASA. No matter what they'll ask me to do, I want to do that. People do that with various organizations. Or um, you want to work for a specific person, okay? That's kind of what I did there in that first job when I, when I came to work for Dave, my, my career mentor. Um, I, I was in, it was a lateral move, essentially, but I really wanted to work in his organization at that time. And, and the job was interesting, too. So all three of those are valid, and you may at various points in time do any of them. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but I t I've worked with several people. I had uh, an individual, actually a youngster in my office some, a couple years back, and she was weighing a move to the private sector versus staying in the government. It doesn't really matter. We talk about goal setting earlier. You talk about job searching. However, one way you can do it is to liken it to when you go f to buy your next house, right? Normally, when you go to buy a house, you have certain things in mind that you want, and you have certain things that would be great if they're there, but you could live without. And then you have certain things that would be deal breakers, right? Like, I probably wouldn't want to live next door to an elementary school at this point in my uh, life, right? Um, I wouldn't want to travel 26 weeks a year, okay? But some people only want to travel. They don't want to be in the office. They're like rats and traps when you bring them into the office, right? I've seen that. Um, so you kind of go through and actually have a conscious list, right? And then you let that list be your guide. So all of a sudden you're interviewing for this position. You get wound up in the moment and you're, and you're saying, wait a second, this job has four things on it I said I don't want. Why are you there? Probably a good idea to back out of that one. Um, application tips. Application, this whole process, now we'll talk about this quickly. Applying for jobs is um, very, very difficult these days because the automated systems and things develop, we get huge amounts of applications. We had a GS-14 position uh, out recently uh, for a training and development specialist, and I think we got 120 plus applications, okay? It's difficult to stand out in that because even, I mean, we have to be realistic. Folks got to get through that fairly quickly to try to size you up. So you got to hit them fast that you're, that you're qualified. Um, but you, so you got to have quality paperwork, quality paperwork, and you need to take the time to tailor it to the job. Again, like I said, if you're applying for every job that's out there, you're basically sending a, a cookie cutter application. You're not tailoring it to make sure that those KSAs, tech quals really match what you're trying to do. It's important, people, want to get, they fall in the habit, they just go to their job description and they take the bullets and they put it in their, in their resume. No, that, we don't wanna, that's not what you wanna see. What we wanna see is what you did, what resulted. We'll talk more about this as, as we get to it. But just looking at your duties and responsibilities, I mean, yes, that's important, but what did you actually do? What makes you special? Because you've gotta stand out from 120 people or whatever. We have folks applying for SES candidate development programs, they get maybe five, 600 applications for those and they'll only say maybe take 50 or 60. That's, that's tough, right? Because everyone's talented in that, in that group. Proofread and edit your package carefully. You know, it's interesting. I, I did that extensively on this and yet I found two mistakes even as I was metroing over today, which we did fix in here, but aren't in yours. That's really aggravating, but it was extensively reviewed. It still happens. But and you almost always find something, but if you have error after error after error, it speaks to a lot of things and it doesn't reflect well. Make sure that you include everything that's required. If it requires an SF50, if it requires a performance appraisal, et cetera, make sure it's there. If it's not there, you're gonna be out. 
And um, if you have any questions, reach out to the servicing HR specialist before it closes. Interviewing trip tips. This is what I was working on with that individual earlier. Um, dress professionally. You, you look good when you go in there. Um, don't bring a bunch of stuff in there. Bring in, I recommend a notepad and pen to be able to write a little bit down so you stay on track with the questions. Maybe a bottle of water, something like that. Uh, don't, don't bring in your dripping coffee cup uh, or anything like that or a bunch of stuff that you want to turn over to the panel that they're not going to take. Just simple, clean and simple. Make good eye, eye contact and panel, uh, with the panelists and smile periodically. You know, look, look interested and excited. Demonstrate passion and enthusiasm for the position. We can tell if you really want it. Monitor your time like I'm doing with that clock up there. And maintain an effective pace when speaking. Okay. Answer the question that's asked and all parts when it's asked. This is why it's important to jot down notes because a lot of these questions, especially behavioral interviews, very long questions. Okay. And if I ask you for your strengths and your weaknesses and you give me your strengths, what happened? You just missed half of it. That's it. You miss half. Okay, you got to get all parts. And some, there's like, what's the greatest success you've had? Why? And what did you take away from it? That's a three-part question. If you only give me two, you missed a third. You got to get all parts of the question when it's asked. Use the best, most positive words you can. Now, we could talk literally for hours about this issue. Um, and, and, I'm gonna, and it leads into my next one, which is the red flag or cockroach rule. People use words all the time. They sound harsh. They can be off-putting, especially if people don't know you. If you're interviewing for a position where they don't have any idea who you are, they will, they will draw conclusions about your makeup from what you say. If you go in and say, oh, man, that office I was in, was, it was just ripe with conflict. Everyone was antagonizing each other, et cetera. Ooh. Or, yeah, I don't micromanage like she does. No, no, you, the first case you would say, well, the previous office I was in struggled from a lack of collaboration and it was hindering productivity. You said the same thing. Everybody knows you said the same thing, but it sounds a lot better. Or uh, I don't micromanage, no. What I, I like to give my folks the independence and autonomy that they can handle to get their work done. Same thing, totally different, trust me. The, the, the cockroach rule is this. You won't ever forget this. You'll remember Hutton Locker said this. Cockroach rule is this. One is an anomaly. Two is a trend. Three, you call the exterminator. So if you start launching red flags through the interview with those kind of commentary, my guess is eventually they're going to say, this person is not right for us. Okay? So one anomaly, two trend, three, call the exterminator. Get it? Never forget it. Word choice, critical. Don't fidget. Brought a youngster in, same one I did the house hunting list with. Brought her in for a mock interview years ago. Uh, sits down, looked great. Uh, we start. She turn, tilts her head and starts twirling her hair in her, with her finger. I'm not kidding. Remember, I don't make anything up. It's all true. I looked at her, I said, what are you doing exactly? And what? I said, you're twirling your hair. You can't do that. And you can't be banging your pen in and out and putting your finger around your dripping coffee cup. No, don't fidget. Don't. You know, your hand gestures is one thing, but fidgeting and stuff, no, be professional. And um, when the time comes up, ask some good questions. You know, what do you see as the, uh, as the greatest challenges of the organization? What are you looking for in the position? Don't ask, can I telework? Um, or can I leave at three? That's probably not the best time is when you're in the interview. Okay. All right. Still doing okay. All right. Senior executive service. Now, for those of you, let me just ask by show of hands, how many of you in this room are interested in SES at some point? Okay. For those of you on, it's about a third. We'll have to work on that because we, we need more of you to be interested. But uh, I understand uh, that it's, uh, it is becoming increasingly challenging. We see that in the media. Uh, the SES obviously was established uh, in order to build this cadre of, of senior level managers kind of below the political uh, and above the GS to sort of be the policy folks 
uh, and to really lead the organizations over, over time. And there's a lot of information out there on there. I've got um, in the presentation information that you can read and, and, and know where to go to get more. The key is to know there's only about 7,000 SES in the entire federal government. They're allocated slots by OPM. They're restricted. You, everybody, you can't just have one because you want one. So what ends up happening is there's a lot of GS-15 jobs that are very complicated too, but the SES, basically you have to kind of compete for the slot and ultimately the decisions are made. Now, I just want you to think about it. USDA has 90,000 people or so and 300 senior execs. It's, okay. So you're typically going to see it's typically about two or 300 per as a general rule. And then there's this, uh, um, and then there's some like political appointees and all that are non-career. And then there's also this whole area of senior level technical positions. That's a, a even more restricted group. Uh, they don't necessarily have the same degree of leadership responsibility, certainly not in large organizations. They tend to be highly technical uh, scientist type, like veterinarians or, or plant scientists or MDs or those kinds of things. Uh, and you can see there, there's only about um, 1,100 total of those. So, we, we, you know, that's something if you can pursue that down the road. But becoming a member of, of the SES, there's really two ways you can do it. You can do it through a competitive announcement or you can do it through an SES candidate development program. Uh, 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 basically, those are the two tracks. Now, the, the real difference is Everybody to be appointed to the SES has to be certified by OPM through a qualifications review board process before they can be an SES. If you've not gone through a candidate development program and you just apply as a 15 for an SES job, after the secretary approves it, it and that's a whole process we'll talk about, but then it, the last step is that it goes to OPM for certification, where a panel of people who do not know you, do not even have association with your department, look at your um, paperwork and decide whether you're essentially SES worthy. And th that's the final step. Now, if you go through a candidate de development program, at the end of the program, you can apply for certification and get it. And that allows you to be non-competitively appointed, or at least to sidetrack that last step when you are selected. And the secretary says, then that's it. That's the final step. That's the real only difference there. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit. I want you to understand the number of people it takes to actually get you through an SES job. The first, after you apply and HR looks at the applications, the applications go to the a executive merit staffing board, which is usually a panel of three executives from within the department who decide, they, they go through and they rate the paperwork and decide whether or not you get to the next stage. And they tend to be very, very demanding, even at this stage. And you may only get, we've seen a lot of certs recently that had only like two, three, four names on them, okay? Because there's people either get it right or they don't, okay? But then, you, so you got to get through that. Then you get to the selecting official, you go through the interview process, et cetera. They decide this is who you want. Then the paperwork has to go through this whole process of all these departmental offices. Ultimately, the secretary signs off. Secretary has to sign off on everything for SES. And then, like I said, if you haven't already been certified or aren't already SES, you have to go to OPM for that final step. So those are the basic steps. The core qualifications for SES is different than in any other job you've applied for. It's much more demanding. There's information on here, but there's five. Leading change, leading people, results-driven, business acumen, and building coalitions. And each one of those has sub-competencies, okay? And they're listed in here. We won't go through them now. You can do that on your own leisure. But essentially, and then there's some fundam fundamental competence that they look for throughout. What happens is you have to write narrative statements to those five ECQs, leading people, leading change, results driven, business acumen, and building coalitions. And they basically, typically what you do, it's 10 pages of narrative, typically two examples for each one, so 10 examples. Okay, N not snippets of things you've done various places that might relate, detailed, fully evolved stories around that demonstrate your expertise in those areas, okay? And there's this thing called the Challenge Context Action and Results Model, CCAR, which must be used to develop them. If you don't use that, they know right away and it's not gonna go well. You have to identify the issue, 
why we should care, why it's important, what you did, and what came of it. You have to do that five times at least. Generally, it's 10, because generally you do two stories for each one, different stories, okay? But you can read up on that. I want you to remember this, okay? This is one of those things that I want you to remember. It takes the involvement and support of many people to get someone an SES job, one of those 7,000 jobs. And it only takes one person to undo it. Could be the secretary says no. Could be the QRB says no. Technically, it's three people, but nonetheless, somebody writes back and says that person is not getting through. It could be a reference check and someone says, oh, that guy doesn't work well with people. Oh, I bet that's the number one thing that gets people not SES jobs, not working well with people when they do reference checks. Okay, so then just to kind of wrap this all up, and tips for career success, maintain a personal commitment to excellence. Be a low-maintenance asset. Don't, you know, come in, do your job, make great things happen, go home. There's enough other people that are making the boss's job difficult. If you can avoid doing that, that gives you a step ahead right there, okay? So be a low-maintenance asset. Play well with others. I've said that enough. Do you get it? Is, is, does everyone have any idea? Okay, share information. Be open and honest with people. Help others. Surround yourself with as much talent as you can, especially as you move up into leadership roles. Do not, do not think you have to be the smartest person in the room. Believe me, I don't, and thank God because it wouldn't work. I mean, I try to get the smartest people in positions around, that's part of your job. And, and you want to build that uh, kind of assembly line thing where if you lose one, you can get another one because that's the kind of organization you have. Hire the best. You don't have to be the smartest. Endeavor to make your supervisor's job easier. If everyone does that, everybody wins at all levels. If I can make the IG's job easier, deputy IG's job easier, then they can tend to spend more time with someone else and all the way down the chain. And choose your jobs wisely. With that, we have a couple of minutes, I think, for questions. Does anyone have a question? Use your I'm sorry. I was going to say, based upon the, um, and mom, I'm a little under the weather, so excuse my voice. Um, based upon what you talked about, the how people get into the SES role, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like the the um, the candidate program was like the best route. Is that is that true or no? Well. It, I, if there's been a little bit of a hiatus in some of the departments with the candidate development programs due to the transition of administration, but I would say it's an interesting thing. This is a good question he asked. Um, back when I was a youngster working for, for Dave back almost 30 years ago, uh, the SES, uh, whenever the SES programs uh, came out like that, they weren't as highly regarded back then and they didn't result in as many folks actually getting appointments because I'm just being honest with it. What happened back then was the agencies had a lot of uh, control over who got in, and they used it as parking lots for problems and things. And then what happened over the more recent past is that they took that out of it, and it's a highly competitive process managed very um, independently and objectively, and so the people go through this, all these panels and interviews and things, and they end up getting really, really good people in the programs. So in the, in the recent years, um, and the success rate of these folks is much greater. I have, I'm glad you asked that because I, I can do a promotion. I have been an SES CDP mentor to three individuals, and all three were SES within very short order after finishing. The program in, and that's going back in the, in the last um, you know ten years or so. But there are people that had gone through those programs years before and all that have never gotten them. But the success rate has been much much greater. So I think, and the other thing I'd say about it, it's not just about getting a job; it's about getting better at what you do. And the programs, there's tremendous value. Uh, you meet a lot of people. You do special projects. Um, uh, detail assignments, you're going to be a better person at the end as well. So I think if opportunity to get in an SES CDP exists, I, I recommend it wholeheartedly because I think they're really good uh, now uh, and they have been in the recent past. 
So what I would say is that. Now, if one doesn't avail itself or for whatever reason, you know, you don't get in, I know plenty of people that haven't been able to get an SES CDP program that subsequently got an SES through the competitive process. So those are two tracks. But I would say first pursue the SES CDP as a developmental effort to make yourself better. Fair? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? You got one? Yeah, we've got a, a few. I know we're running a little low on time, but um, what, what are your uh, suggestions for when someone has responsibility but no authority? So basically, ideas for leading people who don't want to be led or if you're responsible for getting something done that relies on other people um, who you have no sort of management authority over? Well, that's a complicated question. I think... Um, you know, part of the part of the job of uh, a leader um, is to sort of assess their uh, their organization and their staff, and and sort of kind of over the course of time. As I said, I've only been in my current job a few months, so that process continues. But after you've been in a job a year, two years, something like that, you have a pretty good sense of where folks stand and which ones are responding to you. Um, the thing about being a leader, you're not a leader because someone says you are. So part of that problem might be that you're not doing the right things. You're not motivating folks. You're not engaging them in such a way. So it is a two-part story. But you need to make sure you're doing the right things and, and sort of energizing folks and so forth. Now, one of the other things that sometimes comes into play is that sometimes people are in the wrong job. I've had situations where folks were demoralized, downtrodden, et cetera. There's the burned out of the job they were in. You got them in a, another job within the scope of responsibilities you have, and they just take off. I had a great example of that when I um, went to that uh, inspection program office originally in 96 as 14. One of the 13s there was disappointed because he didn't get the job. He'd been around a long time. He figured he was never going to get a 14, et cetera. And, you know, we worked through that. He was a super nice guy, wonderfully nice guy. And um, uh, the individual had a hearing impairment. And because of a scary episode with a fire drill, had a very, very great passion for safety and health issues. Well, I had an organization where people were in reefer units around forklifts, uh, pallets, all these kinds of things, is issues all the time. So I had a real need for safety awareness in that organization. And I shifted this individual into that area, and he just took off and blossomed and eventually became the director of our assistive technologies uh, unit, target center in USDA, and retired as a GS-15. So there's a lot of parts to that question. Part of it's you. Are you doing the right things to motivate? And is the person in the right job? And, and sometimes there are situations you know, where a situation doesn't work itself out, and then you have to look at the performance management aspect. But that shouldn't be the first, first path. I guess if we could take either one more in the room or one more on the phone. Any, any other questions in the room? Okay, so one more on the phone. We had a lot on the phone, so, so sorry I will uh, forward the questions on, but we'll have uh, Brent's going to read off one more question from online folks. Sure. It sounds like the, the person you were just talking about had sort of the ideal scenario of a supervisor who was willing to work with them to find the right path. But a couple people were asking about, you know, you, you talked about being a great fixer and the go-to person. Mm -hmm. But that can also make you someone who's indispensable and that they don't want to let go or don't want to put on a detail or something like that. So how do you sort of balance being that indispensable person but also uh, work with your supervisor to expand beyond your role if you are looking for that? Well, you know, there's no, right, there's no one answer to these issues, right? I can tell you that my previous administrator was not thrilled um, when I told him I had decided to move. Um, and, you know, but he understood and was supportive of it. And, um, and, you know, people do what they do for various reasons. Um, I think that every relationship between a, a leader, a supervisor, and an employee um, is its own relationship. It's almost like a marriage, right? And, you know, what I'll say is this. A supervisor who doesn't want their folks to develop in advance because they may leave is as unenlightened as the one who will not seek to hire the smartest person available because they don't want to look 
less bright than that person. So I'd say, you know, you go back to those things of as you choose jobs and how you make decisions, you know, some people um, are in situations where, you know, that organization, for whatever reason, isn't supportive of their development, isn't helping them. And I think at that point, you have to say, well, maybe this isn't the place for me, right? And typically, it's the employee that has to make that decision, because unless the supervisor or leader is kind of doing something they shouldn't be doing, it's just kind of the way the system works. So you say, you know what, this isn't the place for me, so I'll find another path. Now, short of that, though, there should be discussions, performance management meetings, when you develop your IDP, these kinds of things, about the need to, um, you know, feel like you need some opportunities outside of that. Now, there's also a lot of situations where there, we're almost begging folks to take on a special project. Raise your hand in that case. Um, but I would say ultimately it's part of your due diligence to, to know how an organization feels about moving you uh, around and up for your, you know, to develop you as well as to help the organization. So each one's situational. It starts with communication um, and then it just drives your decision-making on what you're gonna do. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. And I will be sending out the slides and links.